Good morning. Thank you for joining with us. My name is Lawrence and I'm on the leadership team at King's Church here in Upfield, East Sussex. You're very welcome. This morning we will all be able to engage with each of the elements of the meeting. This will include some sung worship, led shortly by Charlie and Grace, the children's work, which has already been sent out to parents earlier in the week via email, and towards the end of the meeting we will be able to take communion together, which will be led by Aid following his talk. In addition, there are two Zoom meetings scheduled to follow our time this morning, and I'll give more details of those later. Finally, we'll be forwarding some notes and questions from AIDS Talk to the community group leaders so that we can all use some time later together in the week to chat through some of the practical applications that come out of AIDS Talk. So, engagement, and fellowship now, after the meeting, and throughout the week. Um, in the Bible it says in 1 John 1 verse 3, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. Yes, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. What a great welcome to gather us all together. Let me pray as we start our time. Almighty God, we're gathered here today, Lord God, as your people, to offer you our sacrifice of praise and worship. We come with different walks of life behind us. Some have walked with you for many years, others are just starting their journey. Some come this morning strong, others weak, some full of joy, others burdened by care. You love each of us in equal measure, wherever we are this morning, and you pour out your blessings to us in equal measure. We worship a God of promise, whose saving grace brought a people from captivity into a land of promise, whose enduring love still leads us from places of captivity into a promise of peace, forgiveness, and eternal life. Be with us this morning as we gather today and gather together. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's go straight over to some sung worship from Charlie and Grace. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven.
To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down to you our hearts, to you our hearts are open.
shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus name sing our praise you both. I mentioned earlier that there are a number of Zoom meetings today, two of which follow this meeting. Details of all have been sent via the church email and you're very welcome to join with us. The first is a special gathering of the Ignite children and their parents along with some of the Ignite leaders. For those who are looking in this morning, Ignite is a group of children that would normally meet during um, a normal church meeting on a Sunday morning, meet in person. But obviously, due to COVID, the group benefits from the internet, either resources that are sent out or the opportunity, like this morning, to meet together. And this will be directly after the meeting finishes. The second Zoom meeting, again straight after we've taken communion, is for everyone else in the church. It's our twice monthly opportunity to meet with other church members online to chat and catch up on family news and activities. And finally, one more Zoom meeting today, this evening at seven o'clock. We have an opportunity to pray together as a church, a time we call engine room, because we believe that prayer drives the whole church forwards. Details to join have been sent out with the church email during the week or, in the case of Ignite, personal invitations have been sent to parents in advance. So I look forward to seeing many of you at these Zoom meetings later today. And now I'd like to invite Aid, who leads the church here in Upfield, to speak to us. His title is Faith, Hope and Love in a Polarised World. And then we'll take communion again, led by aid. So let me hand over to him now. Good morning, everyone. Um, at the end of my message this morning, we will take communion. We'll remember the death of Jesus. And I trust that even right from the outset, that will be something you're pondering, because I believe uh, all that I say actually uh, can be said to centre on the gift of Jesus Christ and all that has been accomplished through him laying down his life. So uh, that's where I'm headed this morning. We'll be taking bread and wine to remember the death of Jesus. As I'm sure you're aware, we live in very polarised times where there is great division on any number of issues. We see it with Brexit and the decision uh, by way of the referendum to leave the European uh, Union and people have very strong views on that. I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, we see it too with divergent views regarding the Covid crisis and what should be done. Uh, that can be something that polarises people as well. We see it uh, on our TV screens in terms of the recent riots in America um, it, reacting to uh, yeah, seemingly clear police 
um, brutality uh, and, and it's exposing deep racial fault lines in that society over there. We see social media and in fact the media in general seem to add fuel to the fire uh, as people engage in opinionated and unguarded exchanges. Things aren't helped of course by the trading of insults at the recent US presidential debate. Is this how we are supposed to interact with others with whom we don't agree? So how are we as Christians meant to respond to all this division and hostility? Well, we want to respond in keeping with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Today, I want us to look at three things. The foundation of our faith, the reason for our hope, and the priority of our love to help us understand how I believe God wants us, his people, to live in times like these. In the first instance, our response as Christians needs to be built on the overcoming of the greatest division and polarisation that has ever existed in the history of humanity. And what would that have been, I hear you ask? Was it the separation of East and West in the Cold War? No. Was it the great injustice and racism of apartheid in South Africa? No. Let me tell you then, the greatest division and polarisation that has ever existed in human history is that which separated me, you and indeed all humankind from God. And this then brings me to my first point. Number one, the foundation of our faith. The foundation of our faith. God has overcome the greatest of all divides. God has overcome the greatest of all divides. The Bible tells us that God made us to be in relationship with him, to serve him, and to honour him, to find our sense of security, identity and fulfilment in this relationship with our creator. But the story of humanity has seen us turn from God in all his love and goodness and instead look to live our own way, independently of him. This catastrophic choice results in us being separated from God the consequences of this existence as those now alienated from God, they are truly dire. We don't know his love or his life as he would wish us to. And instead, death is at work in us and we are in fact under God's right and just judgment. The Bible says that this state of play means that we are enemies of God. That's Romans 5 verse 10, that we are enemies of God. And as you can imagine, that's not good. Now the solution to this problem has come all from God's side because there's nothing we can actually do about it. It's impossible for us to bridge this gap. You see, it was God himself who came to the messed up human race of which we're a part and he made a way for this great and awful divide to be overcome. Jesus was born as a baby. The author of creation was confined and humbled himself and was born as a human being. He grew up to give up his life. He was born to die. That was his mission. He grew up to give up his life to death on the cross. He did this as our representative in our place, on our behalf, to become subject to the just judgment of death. That's the curse of our rebellion against God. And Jesus took it upon himself. Philippians 2 
verses 6 to 8 say this, speaking of Jesus leaving the glory of heaven and coming to earth, coming to rescue the human race, coming to overcome this great division that separates us from God. Jesus, who being in very nature God, he is God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He didn't remain distant and a detached. Uh, he actually left his glory. He put it to one side, as it were, and he came to us. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. That's the king of kings, becoming a servant, and he was made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. That's how he served us. He laid down his life. He died. And it says he was obedient to death, even death on a cross. In his death, he was accomplishing this great act of rescue, of bridging the gap, enabling the likes of you and I to know our creator again. So far beyond any winners of the Nobel Peace Prize, where reconciliation can take place between warring factions, between enemies, between those who are opposed to each other, God, through his Son, has overcome the greatest of all divisions. And this is the foundation of our faith as Christians. So the foundation of our faith is that God has overcome the greatest of all divides. Number two, the reason for our hope. The reason for our hope. The gospel of Jesus Christ uniquely is able to unite people. The gospel of Jesus Christ uniquely is able to unite people. So there is cause for hope in this world of strife and factions and uh, polarised opinions. Uh, there is hope and it's actually because Jesus can unite people. You see, because God has overcome the greatest of all divides, as I've just explained, when people come to know him and are joined together as his church, they now have the most important thing in common. Saved by grace, saved by the generous gift of God, nothing they've merited or earned and this humbles us all <laughs> and because of this those who know God through his son they are now friends of God through Jesus and they are actually all able to be united on that basis and even more than that when we know Jesus when he's in our lives and we're living faithfully for him we can know the work of the Spirit of God dwelling within us, changing us, transforming us from the inside out in terms of our attitudes and behaviour. That means any old allegiances to whatever the cause, be it political, nationalistic or, dare I say it, even a sports team, those have all been trumped big time. Jesus now is the first He's number one. He's the priority. He's the one we're devoted to. He's the one we follow with ardour and passion. And all other, all other allegiances uh, and loyalties are secondary to that. And uh, they fall away because Jesus, he is the one we are most devoted to. Against the backdrop of the great divide of mutual prejudice and contempt that existed between Jews, God's people that we read about in the Bible, and non-Jews, those from other nations, what the Bible sometimes refers to as Gentiles. This divide in the ancient world, like 2,000 years ago plus, was huge. Um, the Jews had a tendency, if they weren't careful, to think of themselves as superior. They shunned non-Jews. They thought, well, we're God's people and we don't want anything to do with those other nations. Although God had mandated them to actually represent him to those people, 
they fell well short of that. They turned in on, on it turned in on themselves uh, to a great extent and became proud and exclusive. Meanwhile, the other nations looked on and thought, "Who do these Jews think they are uh, with their their?" Their, their, their faith claim there to be one God, claiming their God to be the one true God. And so even when such people came to faith in Jesus, Jews became Christians and non-Jews became Christians, there was still the need to work out um, all this uh, cultural, deep-seated stuff. And it was an ongoing thing. And, and Paul wrote letters to churches where Jews and non-Jews were part of the congregations and he would regularly just remind them again of their new unity in Jesus. And he writes to one such community in Ephesus uh, and he, he does <laughs> highlight the, the imperative of this unity they are to have in Jesus Christ. Even though formerly they would be at odds, they would have nothing to do with one another, they would actually hate one another. Here's Ephesians chapter 2 verses 14 to 18. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose, Jesus' purpose, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, Jews and non-Jews, people from all nations, thus making peace. And in one body, his people, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. So in the cross of Christ, not only are we now friends of God, no longer enemies of God, we are now able to be friends of all our fellow Christians. Whatever background, whatever differences there would be naturally between us, that hostility has also been dealt with. Such is the wonder of the work that Jesus has accomplished on our behalf on the cross. Now these words to do with hostility and, and barriers and war uh, might seem hard for us to relate to. We might never have felt divided from other people in such strong terms like Jews and Gentiles did in the ancient world. Fair enough. But let me nonetheless give you an example where this language of conflict, um, animosity, but then peace and, and brotherhood is especially apt. A few years ago, I had the privilege to attend uh, a conference of church leaders from around Europe, and there were a good number from the Balkans area of Europe, and there were some from Croatia and Macedonia and Bosnia. Um, they were from the former uh, state of Yugoslavia and if you remember your history quite recently uh, in the early 1990s there was conflict between various people groups ethnic um, parts of the state of Yugoslavia terrible atrocities took place and the wounds as you can imagine run deep in people's uh, lives the, the memories of what happened how traumatic how dreadful and I'm not making light of what happened, but what is truly breathtaking and beautiful is to behold the wonder of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where those who would naturally speaking be in enmity, be opposed to one another, be suspicious of one another, have nothing to do with one another, are actually united. So leaders from Croatia and Bosnia um, greeting one another with a hug, worshipping together, praying together, encouraging one another in their role as church leaders. This, my friends, is quite remarkable, is it not? I'm sure you'll agree that those who would, naturally speaking, be enemies are united in Jesus. That's what Paul was calling um, Jews and Gentiles to take hold of and that's what I saw in these leaders um, from different parts of the former Yugoslavia. Now what about us? Well, I have to be honest, I've heard of in, in, in a number of churches uh, people falling out uh, over their differing views regarding the result of the referendum on Europe a few years ago and what Brexit will mean 
uh, for Christians to actually fall out about that, to stop talking to one another about that, to perhaps just even, uh, well not just, but to even go as far as leaving a church about that, that is really so unfortunate, so unfortunate. Um, it, it falls so short of um, this wonderful vision that, that Paul outlines of, of unity in Jesus. So if we have differing views on such things as Brexit, surely, surely, if my brothers from the former Yugoslavia, um, who lost loved ones maybe in that conflict in the 1990s, if they can embrace and be brothers together, united in Jesus, we, we can, despite our differing views about Brexit, be in fellowship, good fellowship together in the church, because our unity in Jesus trumps everything else. So, our unity in Jesus means that anything that sh could divide us, uh, whether it's race, age, socio-economic background, education, personality, should no longer be a barrier between us. Listen again to Paul in the same letter, ha, writing about the wonder or, and the uniqueness of the Church of Jesus Christ, telling us that it's actually the most profound and powerful expression of the wisdom of God. Ephesians 3 verse 10, God's intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. People can get disaffected, disillusioned uh, by the church. It's made up of fallible people like you and I, but my friends, don't let your view of church be deficient, don't let it fall short of the glorious, wonderful reality of the fact that it's God's ultimate expression of his good purposes on planet earth for men and women boys and girls that they might be united in his son such is the magnitude and the significance of the church of Jesus Christ that actually the principalities and powers in the heavenly realms I guess that means angels and demons look on and are gobsmacked they're amazed they cannot believe that this is what then God has been working towards all along by way of his salvation purposes revealed in the scripture culminating in Jesus and all that Jesus has won for us. This is the church of Jesus Christ. If you're a part of it, recognise the wonder of what you belong to. And yes, be filled with wonder and grace for one another and savour it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, number two... The gospel of Jesus provides a unique hope that people of all backgrounds, any race, creed and colour, can indeed be united. Number three, the priority of our love, the priority of our love, doing all we can as Christians, as those part of the same church maybe, to protect our unity as the church of Jesus. Doing all we can to protect our unity as the church of Jesus. You know, the world says be completely self opinionated and assertive. Be insistent on getting what you want when you want it from anyone, as if by right, because to do otherwise is a sign of weakness. Make every effort to look after your own interests and don't worry about walking all over others. It's the survival of the fittest in this life. If someone offends you, don't just bear a grudge, nurse it and revel in the bitterness that you are so obviously entitled to feel. This person is now your enemy. Shun them, unfriend them, let rip on social media and make sure everyone knows about your grievance. Such, my friends, is the spirit we see in the world. But we, as the Church of Jesus Christ, are meant to be different. Again, I'm in Ephesians, this time chapter 4 verses 2 and 3. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. We didn't just take offence and walk away. We bear with one another in love. <laughs> Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He lives in us and he joins us together. Keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So, we are countercultural. Here are some of the ways that that will express itself. We don't judge one another. Oh, they're like this. Oh, look at them. 
We don't look down on one another. We don't judge one another. We recognise that those who rub us up the wrong way, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, are actually part of God's purpose to help us grow in grace and be patient with them uh, even as he is patient with us. We are careful about we ha how we handle a fellow believer offending us. You know, it's really noticeable, I find, that someone takes offence and, and then they start actually finding fault with a whole number of things about a given church and the enemy gets in big time. No, we need to be careful how we handle a fellow believer offending us, even a church leader. We need to look to forgive them and not bear grudges lest a root of bitterness grows within us and poisons us and even the church as a whole. We are careful not to fire off emails in haste. An email in haste is a dangerous thing, my friend, because it will likely be incendiary rather than conciliatory. Consider that practical point. <laughs> An email in haste is usually a dangerous thing. Now, we need to avoid gossip. The impulse to pull others down and to feel smug when we are proven right and others fall flat on their faces. We honour one another. We look for the best in one another. We speak well, on, well of one another. We esteem one another. And we believe in one another. And we trust one another. Amen. You see, by doing such things out of a radical, Christ-centred, spirit-inspired love, we protect our unity as the Church of Jesus Christ. We stand out like a lighthouse in a sea of raging cynicism, criticism, negativity and nastiness as a unique community in a divisive and polarised world, helping people to see that there is indeed an alternative. So, my friends, the priority of our love, doing all that we can to protect our unity as those who are in Jesus Christ. And let me finish by referring to 1 Corinthians 13, 13 again. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. Let's place a premium on loving one another. You might find it hard to love me. Uh, you might find it hard to love others within <laughs> King's Church Uckfield or the church we're a part of but let's recognise the love that has been extended to us so lavishly by our Heavenly Father God Almighty giving us the gift of his Son and it's in Jesus that the greatest division known to mankind has been overcome and by virtue of that those of us who are in Jesus are united meaning whatever other difference we have differences we have naturally speaking there is the most profound and powerful bond between us. It's precious. It's been won at great cost in Jesus' death on our behalf. And we need to cultivate and protect the unity that is so countercultural that we would indeed be a people who affect the world around us and that people might see the difference in us and be drawn to our wonderful Saviour. Amen. Amen. Let me just pray and we'll just move into a time of reflection and we'll remember Jesus' death for us, which is the crux, really, of all I've been talking about. So, Father God, thank you for your commitment to humanity, even to the extent of sending your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being obedient to death. Thank you that by way of your death, You've overcome the greatest of all divides, separating humanity from our Creator. But through you, we can know the one who made us. We can have relationship with him. And by virtue of your spirit living in us, we are transformed from the inside out. Old allegiances no longer actually uh, come to the fore in the same way. You loom large. You have first place in our lives. And I ask that we would, as a church... Uh, be those who truly love one another, that it would be a radical, radical statement to a world divided and polarised. Thank you that there is hope, and it's the Church of Jesus Christ, people 
who have been transformed. Hallelujah. We thank you for your death, Jesus. We thank you for all you endured on our behalf, judged in our place. Thank you that you were faithful and you gave everything for us. We just respond right now and we ask that we would honour you in our lives. We pray that we'd honour one another. We right now just confess wrong attitudes. We want to be committed to being in a good relationship with our brothers and sisters. Forgive us for lukewarmness, forgive us for any bad feeling towards another. We even now receive forgiveness and your grace. Amen. Amen. So we're going to remember Jesus' death. We're going to take the bread which represents his body. Uh, his body given over to death. So if you have some bread, you can eat it now and just recognise how you are indebted to God for everything that was given to you in his son. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Then I trust the sweetest free, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Then I trust the sweetest free, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, and the Savior's love.
in the Savior's love through the storm He is not alone Christ alone cornerstone weak and made strong in the Savior's wine represents Jesus' blood shed for us by way of his shed blood a new covenant was established whereby God's dealings with humanity um, meant in Jesus there was forgiveness no more sacrifices um, no other intermediary by way of a priest was necessary Jesus and his death have uh, made a way for us to know our God and know forgiveness of sins which is wonderful and we are a new covenant people we are profoundly joined to one another as well as being joined to our Heavenly Father let's celebrate that as we drink the cup let's recognize we're joined to God and joined to one another in love So Father God, thank you for this time of remembrance. Thank you that the cross of Christ is the heart of our faith. And may we be those who more and more live in the light of all that you've done. May we be humble before you and loving towards one another. Thank you for what it is to be part of your church a community of people transformed from the inside out and may we go on being changed may our love for one another be ever more fervent and authentic Amen Amen. If you've never said yes to Jesus uh, this is an opportunity for you to do that and I just want to finish by praying for you uh, you might want to pray this prayer yourself and feel free to get in touch via our website if you'd like some follow up about Christianity and what it means to know Jesus but I pray this prayer and please echo it in your heart Father God forgive me for living my own way independent of you I recognize you made me to know you and the only way that's possible is through what Jesus has done I confess that I've not lived as you would wish me to live but I've lived as a rebel and I humble myself and accept what Jesus has done in my place being judged and therefore I can now know God I thank you for the death of your son and I receive his life Amen Amen it's been so good to share with you this morning uh, I look forward to doing the same again uh, in due course bless you <laughs>